Batman has a coterie of supervillains. Joker, Riddler, Mad Hatter. You said you were a superhero like Batman. Welcome back, everyone. This will be my full DC Peacemaker Episode 4 video. There's a whole bunch of Easter eggs and references. We'll break it all down. If you're new to the channel, I'm doing videos for all the episodes. Be sure to subscribe to get them. We're also doing a giveaway for HBO Max subscriptions. All you have to do to enter is be a subscriber and just leave your favorite Easter egg from the episode on the video. You see, Batman doesn't kill people. Because he's a He's a dark creature of the night. Careful for spoilers from the episode. If you haven't seen it yet, we'll be talking about everything. And I'll just start at the beginning and work our way through scene by scene, talking about Easter eggs and WTF moments as we go along. Starting with the episode title, The Chode Less Traveled, is a reference to the road less traveled and Peacemaker thinking of himself as a chode. Like he says, I'm a chode and not the good kind, as if there is a good kind of chode. For all you who don't know what a chode is and you're Googling that now, enjoy yourselves. It's going to be fun for you. But the title is also a reference to Peacemaker being on the road to becoming a less despicable person and also trying to atone for killing Rick Flagg. The actual opening scene is them driving back in the team van back to their base after learning the truth of Project Butterfly, successfully killing Senator Goth and Peacemaker lying about killing the butterfly, capturing it in a jar so he can learn more about it. They also have Judo Master unconscious and in tow. Mern also finally agrees to let Vigilante on the team formally because he needs as many crazy people as possible because what they're doing is so crazy. When they're arguing about Vigilante, Peacemaker makes a reference to Matter Eater Lad from DC Comics saying his radar for knowing when teammates are crazy is totally messed up after working with him. He said he saw him eat an entire Wendy's restaurant from the foundation up, like literally the physical restaurant itself. That's his power, he can eat anything. It took too long with his fries or something. I feel like there's a potential for an ad campaign here. Like Rick and Morty has done a billion Wendy's ads. They're all pretty funny. They could totally do a version of that with the Peacemaker series, like a Peacemaker Wendy's ad to pay off the joke about Matter Eater Lad. If you're not familiar with that character, it's a super deep cut from the Legion of Superheroes. So by association, the Legion of Superheroes is now canon to the DCEU, the same way that Batmite is now canon to the DCEU. His powers are exactly what they sound like. He can eat anything he can chew through anything even superman that's right he could take a bite out of superman and consume him for sustenance they create this parallel between peacemaker and leota's character in their problems both pulling triggers both of them had trouble killing people peacemaker because he's all torn up about killing rick flag and then we see some flashbacks about what's causing that and what he's dealing with inside his head Leota's having a version of that, but it's not quite the same thing. But there's this parallel between Amanda Waller being this bad parent trying to condition her, turning her into a weapon, the same way that Peacemaker's father is a terrible parent turning him into a weapon as a child. We'll see who winds up being the more terrible character, Peacemaker's father or Amanda Waller. The whole scene with Peacemaker and Vigilante being passive aggressive with each other is all just part of Peacemaker's arc and Vigilante's arc both sort of coming to terms with the way they've been lying to themselves, being completely out of touch with reality. It's all part of Peacemaker's arc this season, turning into less of a douche and becoming more of a normal-ish person. Normal-ish, not normal. He's never going to be normal. But a more self-aware person and probably eventually confronting his father over all the things that he did to him to turn him into such a crazy person. Vigilante's arc is pretty much the same situation, coming to terms with the death of his family and what happened with his father leaving their family. The only difference with him is that he's still able to actually pull a trigger, no problem. The way they played this scene at his father's house, they make it seem like Peacemaker doesn't understand the metaphor or the reference with the upside down American flag being this big neo-Nazi symbol. If you're a fan of the boys TV show, you might actually remember this because during season two of the boys, the Stormfront Nazi character, not neo-Nazi because she was one of the original members of that party during World War II, for real, and in present day, her superhero costume has an upside down American flag on it. And it's one of the signs used by neo-Nazi white supremacists. So on that show, it was sort of meant to give away what was going on with her character before they fully revealed her backstory. And during episode three, they reveal that Peacemaker's father was the DCEU version of the supervillain White Dragon. They literally show us his supervillain costume later in the episode inside his big armory. If you don't remember that character, it's a super deep cut. White Dragon is this big white supremacist KKK villain from the DC Comics. So they're just adding to the list of things that Peacemaker has to come to terms with by the end of the season to complete his arc. There's another teaser for a future episode when he enters the house. There's this newscast about Charlie, who's named like my name, local silverback gorilla at the zoo in the town where they are, where this is taking place, that they'll probably pay off later. Like, how could a giant silverback gorilla possibly escape? Think of it like Chekhov's silverback gorilla. Like, at some point, you just have to imagine John Cena, peacemaker, getting into a big brawl with an actual, full-on silverback gorilla. 
Because we're talking about the DC Universe, anytime you talk about gorillas, you have to think about Gorilla Grodd and the intelligent gorillas. They've been doing a version of that character on the Flash TV show for a long, long time. Peacemaker then uses his father's secret lair to grab the X-ray vision helmet, as many other helmets as he can fit in his bag too. I love the way he doubles back, like, you know what, I better just grab all these helmets. Vigilante walks in, love how he seems so nonchalant about all the weapons, like, oh, you know, this seems totally normal, what's going on here? Peacemaker then finally explains, it's basically just a quantum unfolding storage facility that's basically a pocket dimension outside the main DCEU universe. So far, the only way they've explained his father having this technology is that he's supposed to be very smart, like a very smart racist. But they might also tie it to some of the other stuff that's going on with the aliens during the series, like this really cool hyper tech that seems so far beyond that anything we've seen in any of the other DC movies, even like the full-blown Justice League movie. Like, how can Peacemaker's father have all this, but Batman doesn't have stuff this cool? And speaking of Batman, as he walks out, his neighbor catches him and continues arguing with him about why he's not a superhero like Batman. Like, Batman has a rogues gallery of villains. Do you have a rogues gallery of villains? He names Joker, Riddler, Mad Hatter, meaning that there is a version of DCEU, Riddler, and Mad Hatter out there. The version that we're going to see the Riddler in the Batman movie with Robert Pattinson is an Earth 2 version, so not inside the DCEU. So whoever DCEU Riddler winds up being, he'd be played by some different actor, theoretically. I also think this conversation in a lot of the other scenes in the episode where Peacemaker's sort of trying to come to grips with what's really going on with his father, like the truth about his father, is also foreshadowing his father becoming his own personal supervillain that he has to take down. And after he does, he will realize that officially qualifies him as a superhero like Batman. Like, I have a supervillain. That must mean that I am a superhero. Then when they argue about whether or not Batman kills people, that's actually incorrect because DCEU Batman, Ben Affleck's Batman, did kill people during Batman v Superman. And this is the DCEU, ergo Batman kills people. And if you go back and you watch the Michael Keaton Batman movies, I believe the kill count in his movies is way higher than the kill count in all the Ben Affleck Batman appearances. But it's a little bit of meta commentary about all of the Batman killing people, Batman using guns that has been happening for the past six or seven years while Ben Affleck has been Batman. It's just kind of meant to be a joke about all the people online arguing about stuff like that. He also tries to make the moral argument that Batman is a murderer on the technicality that he's responsible for all the people who were murdered by his villains after they escaped from Arkham Asylum because he didn't kill them when he had the chance. Really, he's just trying to make himself feel better for all the people that he's killed, like killing Rick Flagg, which he continues to grapple with during the episode. During several of his scenes where he starts to freak out a little bit and get super high, they flash back both to his childhood when his father forced him to kill people, and they intercut that with him flashing back to killing Rick Flagg, as if killing someone as a child kind of broke him, and it also broke him again to kill Rick Flagg. There are a couple moments of self-awareness from him in the episode, too, where he's like, okay, I get it. Yes, my father is super racist. It's just that he's been so traumatized his whole life that he's kind of pushed reality away, which is why he seems so out of touch with reality in present day. The whole thing with the missing money that Amelia Harcourt and John Economos are whispering about in the background of this scene sounds like the money trail tied to the butterflies and Senator Goff in the gland tie bottling company that all the butterflies are using to create that weird honey fluid that is their food source. If it wasn't clear, that honey fluid is basically the only thing that they consume, and they're making it at this Glen Ty place that they keep referencing in the last couple of episodes. I believe we're actually going to visit that place in episode 5 next week. We've seen a couple scenes of that in the trailers, like the scene with the jokes about Peacemaker's homemade bomb. What the hell is that? It's a grenade I tied to a Russian tank shell. How many people does this blow up? I don't know. I it this morning. Then I'm not totally sure, but I believe this rabbit with a cape on it with a UB on its chest is either meant to be a reference to Ubix, the Green Lantern rabbit creature villain, or it could be a reference to Ultra Boy from the Legion of Superheroes. There aren't that many DC characters that look like rabbits with the initials UB. When Vigilante and Peacemaker are apologizing to each other, they continue to foreshadow Peacemaker fighting his father, Vigilante suggesting that he's going to have to take his father down like you would take a supervillain down. Like I said, I think the writing's on the wall, but there is a funny reference later that they make, which I think kind of foreshadows the way that they'll deal with his father by the finale. It's when Leota's apologizing for trying to get Vigilante to kill Peacemaker's father in so many words. 
John Economos corrects Mern, saying that Eagley is Peacemaker's best friend, and that make this comment about his best friend killing his father and Eagley killing Peacemaker's father. Several characters actually repeat that idea. So I think what they're trying to foreshadow here is that Eagley might actually wind up being the character to kill Peacemaker's father, because that seems like a pretty hilarious takedown. Like, can you imagine them putting Robert Patrick inside that costume, like old man Robert Patrick in present day, back inside the white dragon costume, but having him killed by Eagley. Just something in the tone of the humor they've been going for with the Peacemaker series. The really dark WTF jokes. The other funny thing about Leota here too is that when Mern asks her to keep an eye on Peacemaker because she's the only one he trusts, the only member that he was sure was not a butterfly, that actually foreshadows the big turn at the end of the episode where they reveal that Mern has been taken over by the butterflies. So it turns out Peacemaker's intuition is actually pretty accurate. Love the way the Judo Master also escapes from his bonds only to steal more potato chips while he's hiding inside that little closet there. You just have to imagine him in that tiny little closet eating potato chips in the dark, waiting for John Economos to come back. It's also a funny way to bring back that flaming Hot Cheetos joke. Then this whole conversation that Leota has with Peacemaker about wanting to believe your parents are innately good inside but flawed people is also part of her arc coming to terms with her mother, Amanda Waller being just as bad as all the supervillains that they're trying to stop. Also, probably just as bad as Peacemaker's father. The only difference between Amanda Waller and Peacemaker's father is that Peacemaker's father is so over-the-top comedically racist and bad that he seems worse, but Amanda Waller is bad in a more insidious kind of way because she says that everything that she does is necessary in the name of peace, justice, and protecting the U.S. government. And remember, the U.S. government is actually one of the biggest villains of the Suicide Squad movie that we just saw with Starro. They reference Peacemaker's brother a couple times. His father basically says, you know, I wish that he would have survived instead of you. Later at the end of the episode, there are a bunch of flashbacks that they intercut of Peacemaker as a child and then Peacemaker with his brother and his brother's death that imply what happened. First, they flash back to his father forcing him to kill someone to toughen him up. And look at the mullet on Robert Patrick here. That is the most epic mullet you will ever see. Then he flashes back to his brother listening to 80s hair metal with him and in a separate flashback after that his brother dies in what seems like a fight but they only show you part of the fight. I think what they're implying here is that his father forced the two of them to fight each other to the death like forced Peacemaker to either kill his brother or be killed himself and that's what ultimately broke him and caused him to kind of freeze in his state of mental development like he just kind of mentally checked out as a way of dealing with the trauma of what he'd done and that's why he seems so out of touch with reality in present day and why his file says that he was implicated in the death of his brother. Then the way that Leota explained this later, when she's talking to Vigilante about wishing Peacemaker's father would die somehow so that he could be happy, Vigilante taking it as inspiration to help his friend by killing the father. Leota reveals she basically went full Amanda Waller playing four-dimensional chess mind games with him, being a master manipulator, just like her mother does with Suicide Squad characters. But as you see from the prison riot, his father is no fool. Like, he understands what's going on. Like, I'm not going to fight you because it'll look like I'm responsible for all this. When Vigilante says, I think I made it worse, what he means is, is that Peacemaker's father now thinks that the team, the Suicide Squad team, is trying to kill him, so he'll retaliate in kind. And I think that's just all in service of setting him up as more of an actual villain for the team and for Peacemaker himself by the finale. Like, I actually do think that James Gunn is going to put Robert Patrick back inside that White Dragon costume. Back at their video store base, when Peacemaker goes after Judo Master, he does a pretty solid superhero landing. The Atomic Age sign on the truck kind of makes me think it's an Adam reference. And because John Cena is mostly known as a wrestling star, they play this fight like a traditional wrestling match. Even though Judo Master is like this four foot tall martial artist, like he picks him up like a rag doll and just throws him around all over the place. Leota winds up killing him, paying off the scenes of her agonizing over not being able to pull the trigger. Like, I think part of the idea is that Peacemaker will slowly become a better person over the course of the series, and she'll become more of a hardcore person. Like, they're both on opposite sides of the spectrum right now, and they're both coming towards center. When Judo Master was trying to reveal more information about the butterflies, though, before the fight, they thought the butterflies were these alien invaders taking over human bodies like parasites trying to take over the planet. So if Judo Master is saying that that's not correct, like you have the wrong idea, something else is going on, Early theory, it might be another twist on the Suicide Squad story tropes about how the mission isn't always the real mission. Like the Suicide Squad teams were sent to Cortol Maltese under false pretense. The real mission was to prevent the rest of the world from learning the truth about the U.S. government being responsible for Starro in the first place. 
So there's meant to be a big fake out twist with the butterflies. Maybe they aren't really evil and they're trying to either get home to where they came from or stop some larger threat, or it's truly like the Suicide Squad movie twist and the butterflies are also somehow victims of something the US government did to them in the past. And I think the big twist with Peacemaker saving the butterfly actually supports this theory because the whole idea is that he's having trouble killing innocent people. And if he didn't kill the butterfly, I think that's them foreshadowing that it will also wind up not being quite as evil as you believe. And as for Judo Master, they do imply that he'll survive, like they bandage him up and put him on an IV and he'll be able to finish explaining the truth about the butterflies. Love the deep cut Apple Dumpling Gang movie reference that Mern makes too. I have not watched that movie in a billion years, but if you have not seen it, they kind of recap the plot very briefly during the episode. They give you an idea for the context. It's meant to be a metaphor for this Suicide Squad team. The Apple Dumpling Gang is a team of incompetent people, a game of criminals, who ultimately stumble their way into a victory, like Kramer themselves into victory, the way that these characters will probably do by the finale. Also, the Apple Dumpling Gang movie stars Bill Bixby as one of the main characters, aka The Incredible Hulk, so another nice comic book connection there too. Mr. McGee, don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. Also, when Leota is apologizing for the whole deal with Peacemaker's father and Vigilante, there's a movie poster above Mern that says Daddy, meant to be a metaphor for Peacemaker's daddy issues. Then at the end of the episode, love the way Peacemaker kind of breaks down getting high and then getting the butterfly high, I'm pretty sure it appreciates the freebie. We have seen that the butterflies do appreciate human culture. Then I already explained all the flashbacks that Peacemaker has and what they're saying about his brother, him being forced to kill his brother by his father. I think we'll get the rest of this flashback in a future episode. Leota makes the connection to the Glantai bottling company that the butterflies are using to make that honey fluid that is their food source. I think we're going there in next week's episode. And they reveal that Mern has been a butterfly this whole time. I think what they're trying to say here is that while we've been watching him on the show since the events of episode one, the whole time he's been a butterfly, but we don't know his full backstory yet. They've kind of only teased that. So we'll probably get that reveal in a future episode and we'll find out when he became a butterfly. But if it wasn't clear, the movie he's watching on the TV here is a lethal weapon. Then because they do post credit scenes in all the episodes, the episode four post credit scene is a longer version of that duck argument that they had inside his father's pocket dimension. I felt like for a minute they might be going for Howard the Duck reference because James Gunn did the Guardians of the Galaxy movies featuring versions of Howard the Duck in both of those. We'll probably see Howard the Duck come back during Guardians of the Galaxy 3 too. But if you spotted any other big Easter eggs in the episode that I didn't talk about in the video, just write them below in the comments and post all your theories about how they're gonna end this series and what's really going on with the butterflies. My full Peacemaker episode five video will post next week just like normal. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that's happening this week and next week. So make sure you have alerts enabled for my channel so you don't miss it. Everyone click here for my full Marvel Moon Knight trailer video and click here for my full Star Wars Book of Boba Fett episode four video and Easter eggs. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe and I'll see you guys in the next one.